So what you're going to do is using the ulnar surfaces of your hand, because this is where we can feel vibrations the best, we're going to lay those against the chest wall while the patient says something consistent. We usually have them say something like 99. So I'm going to lay, comparing it side to side, I'm going to lay my hands on the chest wall and ask you to say the 99 for me. 99. Again? 99. And again? 99. So if you just quietly say E for me, and again, and again, and again. So you want to do a general palpation in those locations looking for evidence of reproducible tenderness. So what you want to do is place your hands so that your thumbs are approximately the level of the 10th rib with your fingers sort of loosely grasping the outer part of the chest and then bring your fingers together so that you develop a little bit of a fold in the skin. Now ask the patient to take a deep breath and let it out. And what you're watching for is for your thumbs to be moving apart to approximately an equal degree to show equal thoracic extension. Just breathe it normally for me. So approximately this location is where I heard sort of that transition between the resonance and dull. So that's my location of the diaphragm at rest. So now what I want to do is get an estimation of the diaphragm at full inspiration. So ask the patient to take a deep breath and hold it for you. So breathe in deeply and hold it. And so approximately here, you can relax for me now, uh, was the location that I now heard that transition zone, lower for inspiration. Um, the next part is at full expiration, where does the diaphragm go? Um, but some patients will have trouble holding their breath for that long. So it's nice to give the patient a moment to breathe normally between that full inspiration and expiration. So what I would like you to do now is take, take in a deep breath, let it all out, and then hold it all the way out. And you can breathe normally again. So now, about higher up is where I heard that transition zone. Now you want to look at the difference between those two locations, and that's your estimation of full diaphragmatic excursion. I'm going to ask you to breathe in and out through your mouth with your mouth open and just take full breaths for me. So the first thing you want to do is make sure, again, you're looking at the correct landmark because the normal exam will be essentially nothing. Um, so you want to make sure you're at the actual cross over two angle. If you're not certain where that is, you can actually palpate on the patient and feel for the edge of their ribs and follow that more towards the midline where you're going to get to the spine. So the cross over two angle is actually quite high in the uh, back. The biggest mistake that we see students make is doing this maneuver too low and they're palpating down in this region, whereas the kidneys are up here. So this is a percussion because the kidneys are retroperitoneal and you're trying to percuss through a large amount of muscle. So there's two ways you can do this. You can do this directly on the patient's skin or onto your own hand, but this is with a closed fist. So I generally will just percuss directly on the skin, but you can also percuss on your hand. You want to place your hand on the area of the costa vertebral angle and then a firm tap on that location. If you're going to do it with just your hand, it's again at the area of the costa vertebral angle and a firm tap. If we look at her bending forward, what she's done in the past, the last 18 months, is she's been very guarded. So when she moves forward, she basically moves forward in extension. Now that's fine if you're lifting something really heavy, you need to keep yourself in, in a neutral position. Um, but if you're just bending forward day to day, you can't keep yourself locked up in there. So 
her spine, because it's her spinal multifidus muscles and all her stabilizers are sort of tonic, they're not really working very well, they're very static. She's got what we call uh, static stability, but she doesn't have functional stability. So when she moves, she has to hinge at the hips. And what it'll do is it just means she can't bend very well, she'll just fatigue a lot because they're not working at the stabilization component, they're just getting held static. So if you have a look at this, what Diana does in the past is when she bends forward, if you just go forward for me, Diana, what she tends to do is she, she's in full extension there. That's like a deadlift position, right? Come up again. That's a, it's almost like a perfect deadlift position when you're lifting something 100 kilos and you're lifting off the floor. That's great. But not when you're just bending forward and picking up something off the floor. Or you're bending forward and picking something off the, off the table. So what we're going to try and get her doing is actually bending, getting these muscles from a tonic state to an active state so they can actually control her and let her go into flexion. So if you go forward for me, see if you can release that a little bit more. We've got to try and get her rounding out here a little bit more when she's picking up something light in everyday movement, but of course come up, get her strong enough in there so when she's down the track and she's exercising that she can maintain that neutral spine when she does lift forward to strengthen it up and it doesn't fail on her. Okay? So that's the first thing we've got to try and get strengthening work up in here to allow her to actually hold stability and let go and move so it's more functional for her. Um, Let's get her back up on the bed. I want to show you um, what happens with Diana. Have a lie up in the back, Diana. Do you want to come around here? Come around. Yep. Just put this down. So, if you think about Diana, she's got actually quite good transverse abdominus control. So she's got, got quite good anterior control. And the reason for that is she's had spinal surgery in the back. So, in the back, the muscles are wasted. They're not as good. Okay. So her main problem is she can't stabilize at the back very well. She's learned how to stabilize in the front, she's actually surprisingly good with that. The other type of people who have problems um, in the front, more like say post-pregnancy, okay, um, post-childbirth, that sort of thing, where they've lost their control in the front, and what tends to happen is they are not very good at controlling their forward and back movement when they're in this position. Diana's actually quite good because her control in the front is good, this hasn't been compromised, to control on the back and so her rotation is really poor and you'll see that when we do a, a knee fallout she can't control that rotation of her pelvis it tends to shift and roll like a boat um, where she's good at the forward and back the anterior posterior movement so um, for someone who's been you know, carrying a baby or has had pregnancy or abdominal surgery when they lose that control in the front they tend to compensate and work on the and their muscle in the back Increase. So the actually muscles in the back are actually really strong, their multiplicities tend to be working quite well. Unfortunately it's working too much, so it fatigues. So they still get back pain, like Diana gets back pain, but their back pain is related to over fatigue from the muscles working too hard. Diana's back pain is because the muscles aren't working. All right? So we've got to try and get those going so she gets her control from front to back a little bit better. So let's look at this. If we, we worked on her core, we worked on, she's really good at bringing on her pelvic floor, bringing on her stabilizers, so she knows how to work on that. What I want to show you is rotation control, or lack of rotation control when she doesn't switch anything on, when she's just normal state. And we want to be, like ideally, she wants to be having that control without thinking about it. At the moment, she has to think about it. So let's show you this. And what I want you to do, Diana, is you're going to move your left leg out to the side like that. Well, this is called a knee fallout on Pilates, they call it a hip twist. So she's going to have one leg stable, her left leg goes out to the left. I want you to watch this pelvis where her hands are. Just keep an eye on this. What you'll see is this pelvis will rock like a boat that way instead of staying stable. So let's try that. So Diana, you just try and let that left leg fall out to the side. See how she moves over to the left. That's not supposed to happen on normal stability, come back in. She's supposed to be stable. So if we get her bringing on that pelvic floor, so breathing out, bring that pelvic floor on, up to that 30%, so she's stable through here, she gets that abdominal tone, that transverse abdominal tone. She's got to keep that on, and I suggest breathing in as that leg goes out. So you watch the pelvis now, breathing in, and then breathing out as she draws back. Can you see how she keeps that way more stable now? That's awesome, all right? But that sh she has to think about that consciously at the moment. In time, when she gets stronger, she gets more endurance than that, she will then, it'll just happen naturally, she won't have to think about it, which is what we want. Um, we talked about the rotation control of her multivitis at the back. 
uh, that's not really working. Um, let's have a look at that in four points. So if you go up into all fours for me. Yeah. So on all fours now, four point, horse stance, whatever you like to call it. Okay, so she needs to be, this one here, again, we need to be a neutral spine at this point here. She tends to sag a little bit, so we're going to try and get her a little bit more aware of, okay, you need to be up into neutral, so that tiny little posterior tilt, so she stayed in that position. Again, don't forget about what's happening up in the scapula. Get that a little bit up in neutral, get that head nice and long. So from there, she's got to try and control and make sure that she doesn't move her spine when she raises one arm. We're just going, we're going really low level here. We're trying to get one arm forward at a time. So she's gonna, if she's bouncing on four points, we're gonna go, okay, two legs, one arm, can you raise one arm? Now, when she doesn't use her motto, when she's just naturally, the moment she's just naturally not thinking about it, what tends to happen again, she will shear and rotate. And that's no good when you're walking. Imagine when you're walking, that pelvis is shearing and rotating, and those poor lumbar discs over time are gonna get a lot of wear and a lot of use. Because remember, She's fused from up here. She's fused from L2 to T12. Okay, so she can't move there. She has to compensate and move here. So if we're going to get her looser here, and I'll show you that extension in a minute, if we're going to get loose here, we have to get her stable and strong at the same time. We can't loosen someone up and then not have the, the strengthening, the stability, because otherwise she's going to fall apart and feel very vulnerable, and there's going to be more wear and tear and then more lockdown, more guarding, more problems. Okay, so Let's see what happens when she raises her left arm forward. So have a look at the back. So come over here, have a, have a take a look at this. I want you to see this rotation. So without thinking about Dinah, I just want you to raise your left arm forward for me. Okay, can you see how she just instantly moved across the right? She didn't trust, her body, her subconscious didn't trust the fact that she can stabilize through three points because the connection in the middle is not really there. So she went, okay, left arm, or oh, I better compensate, I'm gonna go straight across to the right. So now if we, try and get her engaging her thinking about it bring it up a little bit more over there that's it again she drops an extension we've got to correct her a little bit there back in the neutral breathing out pelvic floor on now don't forget about multivis she needs to follow this up okay so she needs to pump up her multivis by tensing that up she needs to hold that on and then she's got to try and raise that left arm see how she's really fighting that she's trying to twist a little bit now so she's she's got a little more control so she can trust her legs but Again, when she brings that on, because it's weak, she still gets a shear in here. So before, she wanted to just, oh, I'm not even going to use that. I'm just going to shift away. Now, she's telling everybody, no, no, you've got to use this. It's not strong enough, so she tends to rotate in that point. And that's what we've got to try and get better. Multiplicus first, and then there is rotary muscle. So that's something we've really got to work on. The other thing is, remember, if you drop onto your front for me, Donna. Yep, face down. Her extension, she can't extend... She's fused. She can't extend between T12 and L1. Okay, so and we don't try and with physio, we don't try and mobilise that. It's a fixed surgery. Don't have to worry about that. Very interesting though. She's had a spinal rod on this side. So the case sits in the middle. She's got a spinal rod fused on this side. She's sore on this side. She's actually getting less sore the more strengthening what she does. I want you to see what happens when she extends. Now we we've got to be, don't be afraid of extension. We we need extension to function. So. This part here is needs to extend. We can't have this solid and, and, and weak, we, a tonic sort of system. We need it moving. Yes, it's going to bend more over a lifetime than this year, but if we've got the control, that's great. So if you go into that McKenzie extension, now this, if you look on our other video, McKenzie extension, this is what she's trying to do. What I want you to look at is where she doesn't move, all right? So if you come up for me, Diana. Up just you go. normally. Yep, just normally. So pushing down, breathing out. What I want you to look at is check out where she's bending. Okay, she's bending at the only point she can. She can't bend here. She's bending normally here, see that little curve? Look where she's not bending. Okay, so she's not extending as well as this side. So her left hand side is not extending. It's not extending because she's sore, she's tight, she's vulnerable, she doesn't like that area, she's been 18 months guarding it. It's tonically active, you know, on here. It doesn't want to let go. And she's stiff in there. Drop down again for me. So when we mobilize this here, obviously we don't mobilize up here, but when we mobilize in here, what tends to happen is she's, it's quite stiff in there, okay? And when we were mobilizing before, it was actually getting less stiff and she felt less sore. Whereas on this one, on this side, she's got heaps more movement on that one. It still hurts because she's sore, she's sore. But if you look on this one, 
it just, just doesn't want to go. So our mission is to loosen that up and her mission is to try and get extended at that point and get her loose on that left hand side so her extension movement is better. Now when her extension is better, um, her range is better, she's got more likely chance to switch on those muscles as well to then stabilize it. Okay, so that's with Dinah. Um, check out part three, we're going to go through some more glute work and some rotation work because in the end her biggest problem is 